Will you join with me in prayer? Oh God, speak to us in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our imaginations. Speak to us of your ways and of your word that it may live in us. In Jesus' name, amen. In broad strokes, the Gospels paint a very consistent picture as to what happens on Palm Sunday. There are little differences what exactly the day was. Is he riding on one donkey or two? But in essence, it's the same story, the same understanding. It's when we get into the, well, why was it this way that we get into difficulties? Because there are some deeper questions that are awfully puzzling. All the Gospels go to great lengths to establish the innocence of the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate. The Roman governor thought Jesus was innocent, and it was only the fear of the Jewish crowds that led him to proclaim his, order his crucifixion. That makes historians nervous, because crucifixion was a Roman punishment. Only Romans could order a crucifixion. And if anything, Pontius Pilate was not afraid of people who were Jewish. He was there because he was a personal friend of the emperor. It was a patronage job. And Pilate's reign there was noted for the number of times that he would goad the population, try to provoke them into a riot so that he could call out the troops and crush them. There was the time uh, he sent legionnaires into the temple, which was supposed to be the most sacred site in Judaism, and the soldiers were carrying their shields, which had the picture of the emperor on it. So they were inviting people to blaspheme and uh, have worship a graven image. It caused a riot. People were killed. Uh, but Pilate did a lot of that, just sort of poking and pressing. Was he afraid of the people? Nah. Why did he do this? And the, the bigger question was why Jesus did this. I mean, he could have stayed in Galilee. He could have had the people come to him. He could have gone to Jerusalem and contented himself with a few miracle healings, preaching, doing some good deeds, uh, you know, attracting the crowds, making sure that he was the person they were going to talk about when they went back home to Alexandria or Babylon or Rome and tell stories about all the amazing things that happened over Passover. But no, he, he pushes it even further. He goes to the square. He overturns the money changers' tables. He's coming in as though he's a king, directly challenging the people who thought uh, they were in charge. He did things that could not be ignored. Why, why, why did he do this? It's important to ask why for three reasons. First, the traditional Christian answer that the Jews did it has been, in subsequent centuries, been used to justify the oppression and the killing of people who are Jewish all around the world. They were Christ killers, and so we sent them off uh, to Auschwitz and Dachau, Treblinka. We exiled them from Spain. We did horrible things. They were always at risk, and even today in this country, this lures its presence in our country and attacks on people who are Jewish. It's still with us. Secondly, because how we answer this question of why did Christ die goes a long way to then answering how are we expected to follow. And we can phrase the question in such a way that we don't have to do anything. Well, it's a cosmic battle between good and evil, and it's a good thing that that's over with. We can go on with our day. We can watch the game in, with impunity because nothing, nothing is asked of us. And third, when we narrow things down to one explanation, uh, we lose people. 
And I've had people tell me, well, what kind of God is it who demands the death of people, the death of his son? Why should I worship that kind of God? Fortunately, we're a tradition which emphasizes the each person being responsible for their faith and their own walk with God, and we got to make up our own minds. So I'll give you four explanations and challenge you to pick one uh, or pick another and walk with Christ this week. The simplest version is the most traditional version, which is that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was part of a planned sacrificial offering. We think this was developed after the fact that everything sort of fit together. In, in the Jewish religion, you, at that time, you went to Jerusalem and you offered an annual offering in a the, an animal or a gift of money uh, or vows in which you gave them to God and your sins were forgiven. And then you went home and you were good for another year. Uh, Jesus was that offering. That was, that was the language of the time that they would understand anyone who was giving up their life. This has been picked up in Protestant hymnary, and we can pick any hymn of the old ones that you could think of, and this theme is going to be lifted up. Jesus died for you. Rejoice, you're forgiven. Uh, live lives of gratitude. This is the standard uh, it's the default answer that most people give when you ask, why did Jesus die? But it's not the only answer. And it gets um, a little shaky when you push it too far. Because we don't really understand why it had to happen that way. Why does God need a sacrifice in order to forgive people? Can't he just forgive us anyway? Why does God need the sacrifice of his son? What kind of God is this? People have always been struggling with this and asking, what's it mean? How do we get this? The, the, most, the classic understanding of it was developed in the Middle Ages, a man by the name of Anselm, who looked to medieval law and he said, aha, um, the severity of a crime is determined by the importance of the person that you've committed the crime against. If you do something against Mary Hewitt, you're in trouble. Because Mary's a really important person. And it's a really serious offense to do something against her. Beth, on the other hand, you know, well, you shouldn't do that. But, you know, Beth's not as important as Mary, so. Uh, and if you offend God, you're done. Nothing can get you forgiven by God unless God does something. And so to satisfy God's honor, God sends God's son, part of God, to earth, to live, to die. And with that, God's honor is satisfied, and we know forgiveness. And in medieval days, that worked really well as an explanation. Centuries of theologians were taught this to say, aha, this is why Jesus died. The problem today is we don't follow that legal code. And when you tell people that, they go, huh? Uh, if our judges were to pronounce a verdict based on that, it would probably get overturned, right? It, it wouldn't last long in the appellate court because we don't think that way anymore. So we've been struggling with how else can we understand this? Daniel Day Williams had a crack of it back in the 60s and he said, uh, look, this is not about law. This is about uh, forgiveness. It's about reconciliation. So how do people reconcile one another? And he went and studied therapists who were working with couples, who, one of whom had committed adultery. And then he asked, how does reconciliation happen in this instance? 
and he discovered that there were patterns that were followed. First, one of the parties sat down with the other and fessed up. They were taking a risk of exposing themselves to rejection or getting slapped across the face or being tossed out, but they, they accepted the risk. And there was communication uh, about why this happened. What were the deep wounds, the deep needs in someone's life that were not getting fulfilled in the marriage as it was? And then there was a new relationship that was born out of that. Williams argues God and Jesus were the same way. In Jesus, God comes to us and reveals God's love, reveals God's ways, and takes a risk. How are we going to respond? Now, we responded by killing him. But that was not the end, because God's love is eternal. And God's love, which raised Christ from the dead, brought this reconciliation. So now we are living in the time of a new relationship with God, which trusts in that love, in which we try to mold our lives as shaped by that love, of living that love in our lives. The British bishop and New Testament scholar Tom Wright then offers a fourth explanation. Uh, he argues that the Bible is rooted in a fundamental understanding of what the human vocation is, uh, which is the, the care of the earth, it is to love one another, it is all these ways of living faithfully with God and loving our brothers and sisters, and then recognizing that, well, we don't live that way. Uh, we try to get ours before other people do. We, you know, we, we get our enemies before they can get us. We exploit the earth as much as we possibly can, and we live a life that's totally focused on individualism and nationalism, uh, self-centeredism, many ways that just dig us into a pit deeper and deeper and deeper. The challenge to this is not minor reforms. The challenge to this is to change human nature, that part that we say, oh, you can't change human nature. And Jesus says, yes, you can. And he shows us the way. He offers himself out. He is willing to be a sacrifice. He's willing to accept the cost of being the person who inaugurates this new way and accept death, which comes. But the focus is on what he, the way he calls us to live, a way that does at times lead to suffering and death even today but a way that advances us all to the transformation of ourselves and of the world. So here we are at the beginning of Holy Week, and we're challenged to follow, to walk with Jesus. Pick an understanding. What makes sense to you in your life? and walk with him this week. Follow the path. See where it takes you. Amen.